Um, I am bad at the uh, trying to look at comments and talk at the same time. So um, yeah, let's see, what do we have? Um, the idea of interest space also nice. Yeah, I know some people had questions coming into the event. Um, does anybody want to pose one of their questions that they had thought of beforehand? Um, I know one of them in part, one of the questions in particular related to uh, something that you were talking about before with your experiences um, in academia. Someone had asked, what type of feedback do you usually receive when you share your findings slash ideas? And is there any pushback? Um, I think that's sort of related to what you're talking about with your experiences in school. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, I get the, I, I've gotten weird responses. I, I, I don't even, um, the weirdest one was, okay, so um, I presented my work, what I was doing, and basically what I was doing was um, kind of basically diagramming what uh, the spatial relationships between like blackness and whiteness. So I was looking at things like, um, like, I would die what like things like what what would a diagram of lynching look like? What would a diagram of um, confederate um, uh, a confederate uh, statue in a park look like? What does that like spatially? What does that do? What's the dynamic? Where does my body then get to be placed right in these situations? Um, and so I was presenting kind of all this work, and the professor. Um, Uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but basically he was like, oh, I'm so impressed and blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, and then he went, this reminds me of me and my struggle over the last two years here at this institution, because, you know, as a white straight NRA card member, um, uh, I don't feel like, you know, I've been able to say, right. And I just basically laid out 400 years of oppression and he the way that he related to it was was that the last two years he's been held accountable for what comes out of his mouth um which turned into a whole other uh a thing but it but even better than that he w went on to say oh I'm, this makes me think of carrie uh kara walker my work has no no, it has no, no no connection to Kara Walker. Like right, like um, like aesthetically, like uh, like it was a weird comment. But then he goes on to say Kara Walker, and it makes me think, um, you know, what my family should do with a sugar bowl that uh, that's been in the family since the time that we we were in the slave trade or something like. Um, and I was just like. <laughs> Uh, I was so that was its own issue. Like so, that was like, um, and then it, it was five watching five professors uh, yell at each other and telling each other to shut up. That's what happened there. And I'm just like, and of course, all of them were other white professors, and so it became a performance of outrage, um. And a, and a performance of ignorance, I guess, or kind of like innocence, you know. Um, but what I wanted to tell you guys at that, what, what the problem really was, was that I was, I always prepare myself for stuff like that in a critique, um, that it could happen. So I was prepared for that to happen. Um, uh, but what happened afterwards is the thing that was the problem was that every single one of those pe people literally would avoid me in the hallway and not make eye contact with me. Like, so this is done to me. They perform this performance of outrage and then it becomes a performance of ignorance and kind of, oh, don't make eye contact with the, the one black guy that's in the program. Um, and I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't even like, 
I didn't yell. I didn't do anything. Like I literally was just like, I just, I said, can I, I was like, can I respond now? Like they were so yelling at each other. And then my response was just like, honestly, I think you missed the point, but two, like, I don't really care what you do about that sugar bowl. Sugar bowl is not the pro, uh, right? Like melt it down and give it to a black family, right? Um, I don't know, but like, and then he tried to, <laughs> The best part was, was that he knew he messed up. He really knew that he was in trouble. And um, so he wrote me an email and I just ignored him because I was just kind of like, I don't want to deal with any of you people. But he kept on emailing me and I kept on ignoring the emails. And then finally one day he saw me in the hallway and he trapped me. And he was just like, I really think that you should be a TA for my class. And I was like, no, thank you. I don't need to be a TA. Um, <laughs> But his class, he was just like, but uh, my class is on uh, guns. So he literally taught a class on gun making. You know, he's the NRA guy um, where he takes his students to his farm um, and they shoot like assault rifles and thing. Like, it's just really weird. Um, but um, he goes just like, it'd be really great because, you know, you could offer the urban perspective. And I was like, excuse me? Um, so that's, so that's kind of the stuff that I like the spiraling stuff that, that happens. Um, uh, just for anybody knows, don't refer to black people or black culture as urban. Um, but, um, but that's kind of like some of my experiences, right? Like the, uh, the other experience, most of the time I would say that the experience is positive. I would say that um, people receive my work um, relatively, I mean, like I would say very positive. The, the thing is um, it either it's, they receive it positive or they just don't say anything, which, which is fine with me, I don't. Right, because most of my work is not, I, my work is really about starting a conversation but um, not really about like some hardcore, you know, perspective or like argument of why the world needs to be my way. Um, I'm more interested in kind of the collaborative and communal aspects of kind of creativity and um, um, growth, I would say. If that makes sense. Is there anything? Okay. Anybody, anybody want to jump in here? Nobody. Bueller? Rebecca. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a dumb question, but maybe, I don't, I don't know. Um, so, cause, cause you mentioned that uh, Afrofuturism like focus more on the more communal aspect of things and approaching us, um, I guess, certain topics or problems or issues using a more like a communal solution as opposed to a, a institutional solution. Am I getting that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there like some overlap with, let's say, um, Maybe this is far fetched, but like black nationalism, for instance, where that sort of idea is also emphasized, but in a much more sociological way. Or is that something, or is this like completely different from that aspect? I think black nationals. Okay, so this is I know, I don't, oh. and I and and I would say, and the only reason I would say that is that black national. There's a, usually it's cut, tied to other institutional belief systems like Islam and like so religion, right? Like, and also, and not that there's something wrong with being connected to Islam, that's not it, the, but that it, it, it has this other structure going on. Yeah. It. Oh, I see. And, yeah. and also, it, it's not about what religion is, it's about it's just, uh, um, it just has a kind of an other, I think, philosophy going on in it. And mm -hmm. also, there is issues with national, uh, Black nationalism with uh, women, I would say. 
Um, and then, and so feminism becomes a problem with uh, black nationalism. Um, queerness becomes a problem with that, right? Like, and yeah, it's yeah. this, uh, so we kind of have these issues of kind of toxic masculinity that I think we can argue and associate that sometimes comes along with kind of any kind of nat ism. Yeah, yeah. Right. Nationalism. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I think, but I would say in a way that like, it is just another way of trying to understand and trying to um, project um, uh, people into the future, right? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a good question because, um, you know, there's things that um, like W.E.B. Uh, w. Du Bois uh, um, wrote a short story, The Comet. Mm -hmm. And that's actually considered a Afrofuturistic story, like so. And that happened. And that story was written, I think, was it the nineteen twenties, nineteen twenties or thirties, yeah. um, way before like Octavia Butler um, kind of happened. Um, the Invisible Man is an Afrofuturistic story. Um, it, that which that book happens before you hear this term. This term is coined. Um, so, um, it, I think Afrofuturism is more, more associated with trying to resolve the, the split of, uh, between the Western and the, uh, and then the, um, African that, so it's more, I, I would say it's more connected to the, that diaspora of the African people than it is to, um, kind of, um, things like return home or kind of uh, those kind of ideas. Okay, I see. Thanks. <laughs> it's always fun doing Zoom. It's just like, I'm staring at you, you staring at me. <laughs> um, what are some um so what are so let me ask this question with you guys um when you guys are the futurist club um i noticed that most of you are people of color um is that by like a is this kind of what started for people of color or is this just how it worked out I'm just curious. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I saw August also had their hand raised. Um, oh, where? I, I think, I think the hand is down now, but oh. <laughs> did you want to ask your question first before I answer that? Um, yeah, sure. This is kind of just, I guess, something I wanted to cover like really quickly, I guess, I suppose. And so I was wondering like to you, what pieces, like what's pieces of art and stories, um, maybe even architectural pieces since that's your line of work, do you consider as like key touchstones in the history of Afrofuturism or have inspired your work that you'd maybe point people to as they're looking to like delve more into the subject? Like for me personally, I'm into like space making and interactive spaces in that sense and like creating them. And so I'd like to incorporate that. So I was wondering where you would go maybe. Yeah. Um... I would, um, that's a, I, I gotta think about, hold on. I don't know why this is so hard for me to think. Uh, like um, artist wise, like uh, there's uh, Wutu, um, who, um, I mean, she just owns the game right now. I think <laughs> art-wise, whether she's Afrofuturism or not, like um, she's um, pretty much on top dog on the um, on the game. Uh, Hold on one second. Um, I think some more interesting things uh, to. Uh, so um, books wise, I, I would say, um, I, 
obviously Octavia Butler, you kind of have to start with <laughs> reading at least one thing that she's written. Um, I think the other uh, the other person to uh, read is um, if you look at um, there's something called Black Quantum Futurism. Um, Rashida Phillips. Um, I think she's the one that um, oversees the making of of these books. Oh, nice. I got my filter on, so. Um, the uh, uh, she's good. Um, I look at at. I think Afrofuturism is just so. It's so broad. Um, I would also so this idea of uh, our, our, let me clarify the idea of architecture though um, and Afrofuturism. There isn't any. I wouldn't say there are. There are not. There there aren't Afrofuturist architects. Um, Afrofuturism, um, I'm using Afrofuturism in a way of, uh, of, of kind of a speculative design. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I, well, right now, this is part of the problem. Right now, I, what I'm really doing and what I'm working on is kind of defining kind of using Afrofuturism as a way of defining and kind of setting up an argument and a critique of architectural institutions themselves. So I'm using it to, um, to critique how we train architects and how we teach. Um, and that's where interstitial space comes from for me and um, it's what uh, me and my, uh, pro uh, my uh, creative partner um, call, um, we refer to ourselves as interstitial interlopers. Um, uh, uh, this this idea that um, of um, an interloper is someone that's allowed to be in a space, but not is not welcome. That's pretty much how you what an interloper is. Um, so it's an interesting word because when you read uh, black critics and um, literature, the word comes up quite a bit for diver different authors from um, Bell Hooks to um, um, Mario Good Goodman, um, W. Uh, du Bois even um, I uses the word. So I really kind of grabbed onto that word uh, for a while now. And I always thought it was interesting because it was really, it really explained kind of the feeling that uh, I think a Black person has and kind of an institution of architecture. Um, uh, and so I'm basically kind of creating uh, this language uh, and kind of starting to define what kind of black interloper, not black interloper, interstitial interloper and interstitial space, what does that mean? Um, metaphysically and physically. Um, uh, so um, in a way, I guess, Afrofuturism is a way of a creative process. Um, and how you find your creativity is through, um, is through blackness versus through kind of established uh, Euro, uh, Eurocentric um, values or artists. Um, yeah, so, um, and then you have like, other people who, um, so then you have something that kind of splits uh, that I think is a part of um, Afrofuturism, which is called hip hop architecture, which um, is being explored at this point in, in different ways by different people. One way is, um, uh, is through this um, community engagement um, through kids and it's a hip hop architecture camp. And he basically um, creates has created a program that um, allows um, kids to um, learn about architecture, but using hip hop song um, to do it uh, by translating the uh, songs into physical space um, and kind of modules. 
Um, but then you have like academics like uh, Suku, um, who is trying to make an art, uh, he's beginning to try to make an argument about hip hop and architecture and um, he just put out a book called Hip Hop Architecture and it's, um, I mean, I personally am up in the air about it yet. I mean, like, cause I just don't, I have, for me, something hasn't clicked with it quite yet. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, like, um, I think the idea of uh, Afrofuturist architecture really is just at this point speculative architecture that's used to critique or to um, reimagine um, the world. Hope that helped. It does, thank you. I guess it's my turn then to speak about the club. Um, so, it, it definitely was an intentional process in terms of trying to form a community of people to speak about the future with, to try and include as, as much diversity across different scales. So when we were advertising the club, we tried to reach both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, we posted flyers in every single building across campus to try and get across disciplines as well. Um, and we also reached out to lots of other clubs to see if they could help send out flyers as well. So we tried engaging uh, very intentionally with age and discipline. Um, in terms of race, I think it, it might be because DT and I are both uh, people of color that our own like social networks happen to reflect that as well. And so in terms of sharing the club with by word of mouth, I think that might have been like a byproduct of just who we are and who we know and who we tend to hang out with and connect with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I did, oh. in terms of like reaching out to organizations, I did, um, we had like the, the club for black engineers send out our flyer. Um, I sent the flyer out to like PRISM, which is um, the, the club for LGBTQ uh, people to gather. So I did try and diversify that way as well, but um, mm. yeah, I I was I I feel like we're pretty lucky that we were able to get a pretty broad group of people um, across the campus. Yeah, yeah, no, it's nice to see. I was I was just curious. Um, I guess when you say futurist club, a part of me is thinking, you know, geeky uh geeky boys with uh want to talk about star trek and star wars uh a little bit um so it's good to see um let's see uh, which is fine too i i'm a big star uh star trek uh fan um but i i guess the the interesting conversation is what is future i mean what is the question the big question is what's futuring mm-hmm you know, and what does that what does that actually mean for for anyone, right? Um, right. Are we? Um, and I think, in a way, um, Afrofuturism is also um, critiquing and asking questions about technology itself. That's the other aspect of it. That you know, there is a heavy technology. Um, kind of part to Afrofuturism. And so, but that technology um, becomes, um, you know, like a critique of technology, how we use it, is it how we're supposed to use it? How, should we be using it? Or it's technology used in a different way. Um, so, um, so I think that's, um, so I was just interested in see um, hear a little bit about like, um, what do you guys, uh, I mean, what's your guys' perspective on, um, on, um, on futuring? Uh, you guys are the futuring club. What does that mean for you guys? Yeah, actually, I don't think I told you this yet, but after speaking with you last semester, I was actually quite inspired and there was a line in your bio about how your work creates a space 
for those who are othered by Eurocentric ideology to censure themselves as complete human beings. And that greatly influenced uh, part of the description of the club, which is that we want anybody from any background to join and think about the future because they belong in their own future as well. Um, and that line was actually very much inspired after I talked with you. Um, in terms of like actually, actually how we future, I think all of us are trying to figure that out, but if anybody has input, um, we've been doing seminars with people who do call themselves like professional futurists or study futuring. Um, and a lot of that is thinking through specific frameworks that have been created to start with a particular idea or problem um, and use like specific thinking tools and diagrams to, to like draw out what it would look like in the future. Um, but in the broadest sense, it's about being able to define for yourselves what is a preferred future and what are the things that you can do to, to work towards that. And by being in a community, you get to learn not only what do you want from your future, but also how you might be able to incorporate other people and hear aspects that you may not have known beforehand that you would want to include in your future as well um, in, goal, in the goal of like a more pluriversal type future. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was um, that was the goal for the club, but I'd love to also hear if other people have ideas about what the future means to them um, and how they how they have been working about it. Um, I mean, first shy. Oh, <laughs> um, I was gonna say personally. Um, it's not only about speculating what, I guess, what I would want the future to look like in different sorts of like frameworks for different groups of people, um, but also trying to actively make sure that future does happen um, through whatever line of work that I'm doing. So at least like, well, like while we could spend time predicting what it could look like and speculating it, um, I think also making the active choice of finding little steps of getting there or, or solutions or talking through, like let's say policy or technology um, really, um, and how that could work with specific groups of people as well. And an active conversation could also be helpful um, in futuring, at least that's my perspective, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's 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 interesting, right? Because it gets um, I don't want to say it gets complicated. Everything's complicated. Um, it's just like yeah, whatever. Um, but you know, when we're thinking about like futuring and speculating the future too, you know, the, so the part of the problem in architecture has been that um, I'm paraphrasing somebody else who made this quote that. Um, it does such a wonderful job kind of summarizing kind of the architectural kind of uh, education experience. And he's, he basically says he has no faith in history. He has no faith in um, uh, theory. He has no faith in um, practice because no matter the gender or the race of the individual and the end of architectural uh, education, you are, you come out the other side as a white architect, right? There's such an absence of other view, views and perspectives that it's impossible for someone who goes through that not to basically put that on, right? And I call that, I, I call like architecture school, like the factory for robots. And basically it is a reprogramming into, to become this worker robot. Right. And with one perspective, uh, everybody the same ideas about like what space is and who's great and who's not. Um, but um, and that's changing now. But like this, uh, you know, how do we if we are futurists, if we're going to really think seriously about the future, I, I one of the things I always challenge people is that are you being critical of the things that you believe are true? Like, are you questioning the things that have been normalized and naturalized in our, in our 
in our society, such as capitalism, right? Because capitalism is used to drive so many other things. They use gender, they use race, and it all kind of starts to come back to, you know, here's the Marxist, uh, labor, right? How do you control large groups of people so uh, for labor purposes, so we can have the cheapest labor possible, right? Um, and so I, I, I would, so I just say that because I'm just like, as when you future, you really have to kind of test yourself and challenge yourself and what your belief systems are and why do you believe those belief systems? I think when you don't do that, what happens is you get this kind of uh, real kind of um, generic kind of idea of the future, right? That um, if you're thinking of the future as the glass buildings and uh, uh, neutral clothes, like neutral clothes or something, I would say that like you, you have probably some work to do <laughs> in the sense of like freeing up your, your mind and uh, challenging yourself to look at things at different perspectives. Um, and so, um, because I, uh, so many projects that I have to look at and their idea of the future. And it, it comes down to this idea, like in architecture, it's called world making. Um, and you kind of create these, you know, like all of architecture is a fantasy and is a uh, fiction, right? When I design a building and it's on a page, it's not real, it's fiction. And I'm, and I'm creating a narrative that says that this is the best design because it will do A, B, C, and D, right? Um, but, but we all know that what's the first thing you do when you move in into a new place, when you, whether office, apartment, house, is that you start to make it your own. And you start making these decisions and doing things in it that in spaces that weren't designed for the thing that you wanna do in it, right? Um, so it's one of those things about like, you can, you can speculate the future, but how do you not become a dictator of the future, right? That people have to live a certain way in their lives, right? Um, which I think is a kind of another challenge of people who think about future futurism and this idea of kind of utopias and dystopias um, that um, we, uh, the Western world loves the idea of a utopia. Uh, this place that's, you know, a contained system where things just run the way they're supposed to run. Um, but in every utopia, but I always say this, in every utopia, when you create a utopia, you're already creating privilege and you're creating exclusivity because not everybody is allowed to live in a utopia. Right. And where are all those other people outside of that utopia? Right. Are there, I would argue that in some ways, the imagining of America is this idea, utopic kind of story. Right. Like, like it's even told like kind of a utopic kind of story. And in the beginning, it's just like, oh, the settlers came and the Indians showed them how to grow food and save them in the winter. And that's why we have Thanksgiving. But the real reason why we have Thanksgiving is because they was a celebration because they slaughtered all the Indians, right? Like, so it was like, so it's this kind of weird utopic kind of thing where it basically, um, I would say the colonization of America was very dystopic for Native Americans. That was their dystopic <laughs> reality, right? That's still existing for them. I would say that as an African American, that I live, I'm living in a dystopic future. I am a, I am, I am a descendant of enslaved people. I'm in a world that is not designed for me, or was for me, but my ancestors were brought to it to serve the other kind of alien creatures, right? Like. Like you can, like, so you really got to um, kind of uh, think about like, um, like I, I just want to encourage people not to look at it like they're trying to create a perfect world, but what does it, because it's different. Like I don't, 
if you if you try to design a perfect situation or community, right? Like then you build no flexibility. So how can something that's not flexible grow? The interesting thing about interstitial space and interstitial is that like if you look at like I, uh, cells and like the heart, like there's a lot of interstitial space because it has to pump, it has to grow, right? Like so, so in a way, right? Like you got to create things that that are allowed to grow and to be flexible and to expand and contract, right? Um, if you wanted to kind of uh, um, when you practice futurism, because I think in some ways it can be very fantasy driven, which is one thing. But then it can be also you can speculate in a more constructive way, you know, like on the level of kind of us as academic, uh, as an academic exercise. That was a really great point about um, needing to constantly question and rethink what you hold to be truth. Um, there's a quote that reminds me that it reminds me of by James Baldwin when he says, nothing is more desirable than to be released from an affliction, but nothing is more frightening than to be divested of a crutch. Um, where he's talking sort of like seeking this sort of reliance and comfort within the oppression that you experience as well, and that you want to be free, but at the same time, it's a source of comfort for you as well. And I think especially from like an Asian American perspective, um, that would be like the model minority myth in terms of needing to recognize that it's, it's not something that's helpful to you um, and that it's something that you need to break free of, but it's also at the same time comforting uh, because it's what you grow up knowing and it's what you grow up believing in as well. Um, has there been an experience where you have looked at your own experiences and what you held to be truth and you realized that um, you needed to rethink what you thought was the truth? Um, wow, that's a, I think that's, that's a, a question. deeper question, <laughs> a deeper question than you might not realize. Um, I would say, of course, of course, I think I, all of us should have the, those moments, I hope. Um, but for me, um, I was, look, so I am, uh, for me, I guess uh, I'm trying to think of what, an example that's good. For me, like one of the examples I would give is that um, I am Black, but um, just because you're Black doesn't mean you don't come with some privileges sometimes. I came with some. Um, one of them was, was that, um, you know, I grew up outside of the United States. I grew up in Europe for uh, about 10 years, um, which afforded me the opportunity to kind of see a lot of diverse people and experience uh, d different cultures. Um, and uh, so I would say, and I'm also biracial. I was raised uh, by a white woman. Um, and so there's a lot of, so for me, part of, there was this kind of thing that like, it was very hard for me growing up to recognize racism in uh, some ways, um, because I wasn't directly, because I was outside of the United States. Um, it plays itself out differently in different parts of the world, right? Um, it also, um, in Europe, it was there in Europe, it's so weird. Um, but basically in Europe, what happens is, is because I'm black and I'm American, they're kind of, I'm fetishized a little bit because they, in some ways, they fetishize kind of African Americans in, so, in some ways, I'm not saying this is general, but like the, what they see is they see the, um, because their experience with African Americans is the 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 super African Americans, right? Like the the Josephine Baker, the James Baldwin, the black uh, actors, black athletes. So they're kind of like 
oh, you know, jazz. I'm like, they kind of recognize all these contributions we made, um, which is one thing. But if, if they think I'm African and I'm an immigrant from one of their colonies, their past colonies, then they become little, little monsters, right? Like then they, oh, blah, 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 and they're talking down. And I'm just like, and saying these really derogatory things. And so for me, it was just like, like, so from, and I just brought that up because for me, like there wasn't this, um, um, I got to, I, I, you know, like I, I wasn't segregated into a certain community. I wasn't put like, it was just a different experience. And so when I came back to the United States, um, I remember having a moment where I had to reevaluate like every interaction I had when I was younger and realizing kind of the racist implications that were that were going on and that that um you know it's the survival thing it's just like um it's nice to believe that all I have to do is work really hard and I'll get where I need to get to right that I think that's uh, like you know that's equality all you have to do is work really hard um, but you, but the reality of it is, is that um, there's all these other systems and layers of invisible privilege that happen. Um, and um, so for me, I really had a moment of a realization of just how racist the world was. <laughs> and that took a lot to get, and it, it was, it, it, it was a lot to kind of um, um, deal with. Um, but yeah, like, I think we constantly, you know, like, I think, but if, but here's a great ex specific one. Um, I came from Europe and went to Los Angeles. Um, in Los Angeles at the time, it was uh, the Rodney King um, hadn't happened yet, but it was about to, right? Um, and even when I got there, there was all this tension with the African-American community and the Korean community. And I kind of walked into it because I didn't know what was going on. But basically what happened was, was that, um, you know, what you have is a, a migrant, a immigrant community um, who, who came over and uh, starts to buy and run kind of convenience stores and um, liquor stores in like Compton and kind of historically black areas that are depressed black areas, right? Like um, food deserts and stuff like that. And um, you have these incidents where um, it's perceived by the black community that uh, the Korean community are being racist. Um, you know, they're constantly like, there was a couple of incidents where a girl was shot, a black girl, young black girl was shot um, by a Korean store owner. Like it was just, so it's just complicated, right? But like what, it, what it, and I just bring it up because it was just, I, I realized that it had made me um, suspicious of Korean people. Um, and after, the, and then the Rodney King thing happened. And so it was really kind of, me recognizing and realizing that it was more of a communication issue and it was a racism, but it wasn't a racism that was necessarily being generated in the Korean community. It was uh, them as immigrants seeing the bigger picture, right? And are fed the story about, are being fed the story about how violent black people are how they steal, how they, right? Like, so they are taught to fear this other group. But at the same time, them as immigrant Koreans are only allowed to exist in that black community, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, like it, and it is not, and it was not the Korean community's fault that black people in their own uh, community don't own their property and don't have the same, um, access to be able to kind of even open a convenience store that's that's another system right um, so it really was a thing where I had to really kind of think about you know like that's when I really learned that I really had to check my biases constantly if I was going to do this work 
um, because it is more complicated and it's not as cut and dry as we uh, we'd like we'd like to think it is. Um, but yeah, and I, I think it's also interesting, you brought up before this kind of idea of, um, what was this? Just had it and it just went away. So I'm not gonna talk about it. Cause it, yeah, it's left the building. Sorry about that. <laughs> but yeah, like, um, yeah, like I think it's, um, it's one of those challenges you really gotta think about like, um, what is it that I really believe, right? And like, so now, even when I, honestly, now when I, um, when I get frustrated with a situation or a person, I always check in with myself to make sure that I'm not projecting some kind of bias that I have onto them. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that, I do that a lot with, um, you know, honestly, as a, as an educator and a teacher, um, you know, like I'm constantly checking myself about like, am I treating my students the same? Am I giving them the same level of respect? Am I giving, like, if one student tells me this uses something as an excuse of not getting something done, am I re responding into the same way that I would if somebody else does it too, right? Um, like, so, I, I mean, I think, and that's part of the problem is that like um, the work that needs to be done a lot of times is internal. And so when we talk about things like DEI and like those other things, I, the reason that it doesn't work, I think a lot of times institutionally is because institution initiate this DEI um, conversation because they're forced one, they're forced to do it. Um, two, it is set up so that they are being protected. They, that they're setting it up so that their the institution itself is the most protected thing out of it, not the student, not the teacher, but like the institution, right? So it's really hard to kind of for like an institution to come out with a, like a very uh, like a bold plan or a. A, a radical plan to kind of change things is because in part their interest to do that is not as high. We're almost at time. Does anybody have any last lingering questions? Anybody, anybody? Oh, Bueller. No. Um, oh, it was fun talking to you guys, but I don't. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. I think I think a lot of people are are processing a lot of the information since it was very new to them. So that might be why they didn't have as many questions today. No, um, it's, it's, it's fine too. It's just like, I, I also know that um, I, uh, I throw a lot of stuff out there that um, um, you know, we're, that we really don't have conversations about in, at institutions. Um, uh, trying to change that though, that's why I'm doing this. Um, but I do have a talk on the 31st at, um, at Carnegie Mellon that, that I will go into uh, deeper, a deeper conversation about interstitial interloping and interstitial space and kind of um, ideas of kind of um, 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 how we educate and what does it mean to kind of be in uh, how does one survive and kind of uh, who's othered in a in an institution? Um, so topics about how do you subvert, you know, kind of survive um, kind of mechanism and thrive. Um, so uh, that's thirty first, uh, Serena. I'll send you an email when I um, get the like the location and all that to you, so you can find yeah, everybody. 
Yeah, I was writing up a, a little follow-up notes and I put that in there for you to send over to me. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's going to be a good talk. Um, my uh, creative partner is flying in, um, and um, it's going to be fun. Um, so a big part of the talk is just us having a conversation with each other and the audience, um, where um, we really get to can get into stuff because the, I think one of the things that um, might throw people or people find intriguing is that my my creative partner is a straight white guy. Um, and so our conversations, but I think it's really important that, um, you know, like I use them as an example a lot of times of how to be the right kind of straight guy. <laughs> and I mean that in a sincere way in that, like, I think a lot of times, uh, like there's a lot of, uh, you know, white people who are just like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be supportive. I don't quite understand. And it's, um, you know, if we want things to move forward, we really need, uh, it's not about canceling white people. It's about um, how to, um, helping them to engage in the conversation and, you know, like how to, and to be okay, to be vulnerable in that conversation in a way. And I think um, my partner, Tim, does that very, uh, very well. And so he becomes this ally that's very different than um, kind of um, the ally that tells you, oh, have you seen, we've got this, um, this, you can go here for support or you can go here for support. And also it's not about like making room or stepping aside. Um, that's, um, that's not what the problem is. It's about kind of doing the work, right? Um, and uh, so I think it's gonna be an interesting conversation. For everybody. Great. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to, to forward that out to the rest of the club. Oh, and then the other thing I, I just want to say to uh, to encourage you guys is that Afrofuturism um, may be um, rooted in African, uh, the continent of Africa, per se. Um, but really what Afrofuturism is about indigenousism um, and kind of indigenism and kind of um, so we have indigenous futurism, which is uh, kind of uh, the Native American um, way of looking at it. But I always encourage people to think about futurism and their and their own cultures that they come from. That we all come from an indigenous kind of a culture, and that um, if you want to practice kind of Afrofuturism kind of ideals, like you don't have to go into the continent of Africa, you can go into your own, your, your own background and kind of find those, um, find those, the, those uh, stories, those um, origin stories, um, religion, myths, like cultures that, um, that um, can inspire you to kind of then think about the future, um, future itself. I just wanted to throw that out there because a lot of times uh, people who are outside of the African, uh, 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 the African uh, diaspora, a lot of times they're just like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm not African. Right, mm -hmm. like, right. But this is this is about something uh, even more than that. It's about uh, rediscovering the things that we learned in our past um, that um, we can take into the future to have a better relationship, whether it be with each other, community, or um, with the environment itself. Mm -hmm. um, Molly, I noticed that you just joined. Did you happen to get the timing wrong? I think, I don't know if Jackie has any more time, but uh, if you had questions, it, maybe you could pose one now or you could email Jackie afterward um, because we actually are ending the event now. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I did get the timing wrong. It's okay. <laughs> it's good. It's fine. Jackie, do you have time for one more question if you had one, Molly? Yeah, oh, yeah, no. yeah, I'm fine. Um, I'm, 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 I'm here to, to simply listen. Okay, cool. We have a recording, so I'll be sending that in the Slack, so you can you can review that 
as well. Um, and uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to email me. Um, I'm happy to talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk. I don't know what else I want to say. But, Wonderful. Um, <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'll be sending a follow up email um, to make sure that we have uh, people find out about your event going on later on. Um, yes, just please. for the just the final detail for the for the club members is that we have another seminar series happening next week. Um, the info is in the general channel. You can sign up there. It's with Phil Belogtas, who is an industry professional working in futures and uh, foresight. So he's going to be talking through some of the ways that he does futures as an industry person, um, as well as an hour for a workshop activity where we'll be going through some stuff interactively. So details are on the general channel. Um, I'll send this recording in the Slack as well. Thank you all so much for coming today. Thanks guys, have a great day. Thank you.